All right. Um, good morning again, everyone. My name is Netta Polywall with the Orange County Water District. And on behalf of everyone here at the district, I'm excited to welcome you to our February webinar, a 2020 retrospective, wildlife populations thrive on OCWD land. Uh, you will hear from speakers within OCWD's Natural Resources Department and our guest speaker, Dr. Peter Bloom with Bloom Biological. Uh, but before we begin, I'd like to go over a few housekeeping items. As a webinar attendee, you are muted. Uh, this is to reduce background noise. However, should you have a question for our speakers, please type your question into the Q&A box located at the bottom of your screen here. You may also use the raise hand feature. Um, to keep the webinar moving, speakers will wait until the end of the presentation to answer questions. Uh, but feel free to ask questions in the Q&A box as you think of them, and we will address them during the Q&A session. In the event that we run out of time and don't get to your question, or if you have follow-up questions after our presentation, you can always email us at info at ocwd.com. And finally, this webinar is being recorded and will be posted to our YouTube channel at OCWD Water News. You will also receive a link to the recording via email with the email address that you signed up with. So I would now like to turn it over to our wonderful Natural Resources Department, who will lead us in today's presentation. And to kick things off, we have a Dick Zambal, OCWD's Natural Resources Director, and he'll go ahead and provide some introductory remarks on the topics that we'll cover today. So Dick, take it away. Well, good morning again, everyone, and thank you so much for joining us. Uh, we're pleased to give you some good news uh, from a remarkable uh, year in many ways. 2020, in terms of natural resources on Orange County Water District lands, was pretty landmark in several different ways. And we're going to show you some bits and pieces of that through uh, four different uh, presentations on different aspects of what the Natural Resources Department does at OCWD. Next slide. So here is a brief outline of what the webinar will include today. Um, we like to highlight an endangered bird that we have monitored since the early 1980s out on the Santa Ana River. Um, 2020 was a banner year and Natalia Doshi will tell us about that. Um, we had a um, special study done at Prado, um, keeping an eye on natural resources. It's good to watch uh, top predators like the birds of prey and Dr. Pete Bloom is going to go over some of his findings out in the basin during 2020. Um, we, for uh, several years now, have used a drone to monitor projects, habitat, and wildlife, particularly out at Prado, but all over our lands. And Cameron is going to, uh, Macbeth is going to uh, highlight some of uh, the shots that we took of a project out at Prado, as well as um, a thousand acre plus fire that burned in the basin last year. And then finally, Dave McMichaels is going to go over um, a portion of our nesting box program, uh, a program that he sort of uh, leads the charge on, and we're very proud of. Next slide. So this is um, a drone shot looking out at Prado Basin. Since you can't be there with us today and we're doing this virtually, we thought we'd show you a few shots of what you're missing. Um, this is our field office down in the lower right, our demonstration garden uh, at the left. Um, and then looking out uh, on the basin, 12,500 acres. Uh, up to the maximum pool line. Um, in the foreground is three or four of our wetland treatment ponds, uh, of which we have about 450 acres. And the idea is 
to remove nitrates and other potential pollutants from the water before that water gets down into Orange County and percolated into the groundwater basin. This is actually Riverside County and why would OCWD own 2,150 acres in Riverside County? Well, this has to do with water conservation and our ability to hang on to water in the aftermath of storms that we then can move slowly enough through the dam and down to the lower river so that we can actually make use of that water. Next slide. So Prado Basin is a truly a wild place. Um, there are places in Prado Deep where one can easily get lost. Uh, this was a field trip uh, where we were following a game trail and had to do an about face, uh, the grapevine and fallen logs, uh, log jams and whatnot were so dense that there was no way uh, to, to pass through. The Natural Resources Department of OCWD is tasked with monitoring wildlife and these wild places in compliance with our regulatory permits. We report every year on the organisms that live in the habitat that is potentially influenced by OCWD's water management activities. Next slide. And because natural resources staff are out there with wild creatures on a daily basis, um, sometimes there's um, little critters that, that need a helping hand and uh, we jump in and do we, what we can. As a matter of fact, um, stories um, related to wildlife rescues um, are the highlight of the natural resources newsletter article um, this month in uh, February. So keep an eye out for that. Uh, Bonnie Johnson relates, our habitat restoration manager at Prado uh, relates several encounters um, uh, helping out our uh, wild compatriots. Next slide. You know, you think of bulldozers in and near water doing what they need to do to keep uh, reeds and cattails from overtaking and totally consuming ponds so that we can actually get water treatment. And you think there might be a, a devastation involved, but we always do such things in such a way that there are minimal impacts. In fact, there are organisms that take advantage of the periods where we're reducing cover um, so that we can have the best for the habitat and the best for the water quality and treatment at the same time. Next slide. Um, I want to emphasize that even in Orange County, there are wild creatures living in the habitat that co-inhabits the places OCWD uses for water management. And um, some of those places, you, you close your eyes and blink and you think you're out in a 20,000 acre wilderness area somewhere. And that's enough of me. Let's get on with the real stories here. Uh, on to Natalia Doshi. Hi, uh, thanks, Dick. I'm Natalia Doshi, and I am a field biologist with OCWD. I started as a natural resources intern in 2016, and I've been working with the district ever since. Uh, today, I'll be covering our Least Bells Vario Management Program and our 2020 results. So the least false vireo is a small migratory bird, and it's a state and federally listed endangered species. The Prado Basin is critical habitat for the species, and the Wildlife Management Program is one of the district's huge success stories. Uh, pictured on the left is a singing male, which only the males sing to what you might guess, uh, to attract a female to their territory. On the right are two figures showing the differences in the number of territory, territories over time. Monitoring um, in the Prado Basin began in the 1980s with only 18 territories um, documented at that time. Since then, with the successful biological monitoring program and collaboration with partnership with various agencies, including the Santa Ana Watershed Association, US Army Corps of Engineers, and the California US Department of Fish and Wildlife, the Managic program has increased that number of various territories from 18 territories in 1986 to 719 in 2020. So this was due to successful biological monitoring, habitat management, and a brown-headed cowbird trapping program capturing a parasitic bird from nesting in vireo nests. Next slide. 
So 2020 was a great year for Vireo. Uh, we recorded a record number of 719 territories, nesting success rate of 65%. We also documented low depredation and low parasitism by brown-headed cowbirds uh, due to our successful trapping program with our partner agency, the Santa Ana Watershed Association, also known as SAWA. Um, in 2020, we also recorded our first virio, uh, male vireo on the early date of March 8th. Uh, last year, there were also uh, late spring rains, uh, which delayed a lot of wildlife in the area, including the least bells vireo, uh, delaying uh, females from arriving. Uh, and therefore, uh, they just arro uh, arrived a little later, uh, but it led to many vireo pairs from building one nest instead of uh, a common number of two nests in the season. Uh, pictured on the left is an example of a vireo nest with four nestlings about 10 to 11 days old and were just ready to fledge. Next slide. So uh, as I mentioned, the OCWD Manager Program is in collaboration with many agencies as well as our partner organization, SAWA. Uh, the map here shows all of the Vero territories uh, just in the Prado Basin located behind the Prado Dam in Riverside and San Bernardino County, each dot representing um, one territory. Uh, so counting SAWA's territories in the watershed along with the territories documented in the Prado Basin, there were 2,293 territories in 2020. This is the largest number of territories in the watershed since the vireo was listed. The population of the species is growing, but the vireo are still listed as endangered, making this management program we have at OCWD a crucial effort for recovering the vireo population. Next slide. Uh, so part of our efforts uh, to manage and monitor the vireo in the Prado Basin is studying the habitat and the vegetation characteristics. So one of our other department projects are called vegetation surveys. They're also known as the CUDE surveys. Uh, we work cooperatively with different agencies and institutions on this project, including the US Army Corps of Engineers, US and California Department of Fish and Wildlife, USGS and California State University Long Beach. The method of this survey was adopted from Barbara Coos from USGS and we have statistical collaboration with Dr. Christine Whitcraft from Cal State University, Long Beach. The diagram on the right grabbed from the USGS handbook, uh, method handbook demonstrates how we survey in the field by placing a two meter by two meter PVC poles on the ground at 90 degree angles and recording percent vegetation cover by vegetation categories from the ground up to the canopy. And this is to capture the vegetation profile from ground cover to the canopy and compare it to a vireo habitat suitability model developed by USGS. Uh, pictures on the right show a vireo nest. Um, it's very small, but it is there in the right, um, on the top right, in vegetation, just a few feet from above the ground. And the bottom picture um, is meal fat, which is one of the main nest substrates that the vireo nest in. Next slide. So this is a graph from our preliminary 2020 results. Uh, this shows our vegetation or results from our vegetation surveys um, from the Prado Basin and how it fits within the USGS Vireo Habitat Suitability Model. Uh, on the graph, the x-axis shows our percent vegetation cover and the y-axis um, shows the high classes that we use, um, vegetation in the different high classes recorded from the ground up into the canopy um, by meters. So the blue bars uh, are USGS's Vireo habitat suitability model, and it's comparing to the Prado Basin vegetation profiles in the green bars that are quantitatively showing the Prado Basin falling within the Vireo habitat suitability model. Uh, so we know that there are a lot of Vireo nesting in the Prado Basin, but this uh, study allows us to show it quantitatively as well, um, and to study the vegetation in the basin to document if there are any changes over time. So this is something that we're continuously doing um, in our efforts every spring and summer. We do it at various points and also at, um, at nest, vireo nest points too, uh, once the vireo have left. Um, some pictures on the right showing what we see in the field. Uh, willow are, uh, on the top left is another main nest substrate the vireo use, um, as, a, as well as some like ground cover we document too. And then there is an adult vireo on a nest incubating. Um, so with that, uh, I'd like to thank you guys. And for this next part of our webinar, I'd like to introduce a special guest we have here today, 
uh, Pete Bloom from Bloom Biological. Pete is a renowned raptor biologist studying wildlife populations around the world for over 40 years. So thank you, Pete, for being here. And I'm going to pass it along to you. Thank you, everyone. Yeah, so I'm Pete, and I've been working with birds of prey in California for essentially 50 years, actually. Um, my interests uh, include all of California. Uh, I've worked on a wide variety of birds of prey, including threatened and endangered ones like condors and Swainson's hawks and northern goshawks. But I grew up in the 70s, the 60s and the 70s. Um, I should say 60s, but uh, the DDT era or pre-DDT era. So I'm very aware of how rapidly the status of common species like the peregrine become endangered. And that has always been part of my MO going forth, uh, studying birds of prey is that keep track of them because common raptors don't necessarily remain that way. That goes for any species. And uh, it often takes us quite some time to figure out what's going on. So despite the fact that I have worked all over California, my main study area is right here in Orange County, Western San Bernardino, Western Riverside, LA, San Diego, Ventura. And uh, I conduct research on their reproductive success, their status. I look at natal dispersal and breeding dispersal. That's where I did my PhD on, at least natal dispersal. And uh, how long they live and what, what kills them. And uh, what I mean by that is singularly and, and as populations. So recently, like around 2005, I started noticing that uh, some very common species were suddenly not showing up in Southern California at the levels that I was used to seeing them. And there was no explanation, no common explanation like the traditional one of habitat loss, although it was continuing. But we have you know, huge areas like Camp Pendleton, um, the Prado Basin, the National Forest, uh, state parks, uh, Orange County, uh, Irvine Ranch Water District, and uh, Naval Weapons Station, Fallbrook, and Seal Beach, others. And what I noted was that uh, three species, most, most drastically the white-tailed kite, uh, basically had dropped by about 98% uh, between 2005 and, and, and even today. There's very few white-tailed kites breeding anywhere, whereas there used to be very high densities. Red-shouldered hawk numbers, uh, uh, breeding density had dropped by about 50%, uh, 70%, and red tails by about 50%. Um, we don't know what caused that, and some of those species are still in a world of hurt, such as the white-tailed kite, but it's very plausible that West Nile virus, rodenticides, possibly bird flu, or something we don't know has affected them. So I approached Dick regarding the possibility of some support to help survey, Dick meaning the Orange County Water District to uh, survey this year, 2020, last year. Um, and just to get a, a, another comparison to what I was finding in the Water District on, on Camp Pendleton. Now, uh, not the water district, but the uh, Irvine Ranch, Irvine Ranch Conservancy lands, and what I, what I learned about is uh, what I'm going to talk about today, and that is that we have seven raptor species nesting successfully in the Prado Basin. White-tailed kites are right around. There's three pairs. Well, there could be a lot more. So, uh, if I look at the at the Irvine Ranch Conservancy. There were around 30 pairs of land uh, of, of white-tailed kites nesting on that land uh, 20 years ago, yet the habitat is still there. So what happens? And likewise, uh, we have uh, white-tailed kites, red-shouldered hawks, Cooper's hawks, um, great horned owls, western screech owls, lots of barn owls, all nesting within the Prado Basin. Uh, they produced 134 young that we're aware of, but we weren't, I wasn't going there really to assess reproductive success as so much as just simple occupancy, because this is a pretty rapid survey. And you may not be aware of it, but there are some other species that existed here 
that don't exist here now. For instance, some, there are some egg sets from the Swainson's hawks right at Norco uh, from the Santa Ana River Basin sometime around 1923. There were golden eagles nesting in the cliffs next to, the high, next to Highway 71 at the, at the Prado Basin Dam right there. Uh, those birds are gone. Um, it appears that the burrowing owl as a, as a nesting species may have been extirpated from the basin recently. Uh, I think they still occur here as, as uh, wintering birds, but uh, probably not as breeding birds anymore. And that uh, is what one would expect. Our last breeding burrowing owl in Orange County disappeared about five years ago at Naval Weapons Station Seal Beach, uh, a seven-year-old female that I abandoned previously. Um, that's probably an issue with habitat loss and collisions with cars and foxes and other predators that uh, exist in densities that burrowing owls didn't used to experience. Predators such as common ravens, by example. So the study area in this, for this uh, talk was really the Prado Basin in immediate adjacent environs. I did a little bit of work in Chino Hills State Park. I have access to most of the lands between Chino Hills um, and the Mexican border. Um, you know, that are, that are uh, government or um, conservancy type lands or national forest and state parks. So let's, uh, let's move on to uh, slide two. Oh, oh, better yet, I forgot this one. So here's the distribution of the raptor nests that we found within the Prado Basin. This is really quite dense uh, and, and better than the adjacent Irvine Ranch Conservancy right now. So it suggests to me that at least by 2020, the uh, declines that I had seen between 2005 and say 2015 uh, may be, be beginning to rebound, at least in the Prado Basin. But I didn't do too much work in the Prado Basin uh, after 2006. Uh, I was in, actually involved in my PhD at that time uh, up in Idaho. But this is a very healthy raptor population. Note all those yellow dots. Those aren't by accident. Those are nest boxes placed out by the water district. Uh, barn owls did extremely well in 2020. You might not be aware of it, but they're one of the few raptors uh, in addition to white-tailed kites that can produce two or three broods in one year. And in this year, barn owl, several, several pairs uh, produced uh, up to uh, two young, or two two broods and one nest produced a triple brood for one year. And let's see other highlights. My favorite red-tailed hawks. Let's go look at a red-tailed hawk slide. I think that's next. There we go. So while out um, finding all these nests with the support of um, water district biologists. We took the opportunity once found to climb some of the trees and band a number of the young. This supports some of the long-term research that I'm doing throughout California, but particularly in Southern California. Uh, you might wonder why we do that. Well, it's because we learn fantastic stuff when we know the individuals by name. And for instance, my oldest red-tailed hawk is 28. Uh, my oldest red-shouldered hawk, 26, Swainson's hawk, 25, golden eagle, 34, and I can go on. But that's why we ban birds. Of, that's why we ban birds, is to, to learn about these uh, subtle differences in their, uh, be, be, between species and, and in their ecology. We just had a golden eagle I banded at Camp Pendleton recovered. Uh, it was banded at the Santa Margarita Cliffs next to the river mouth there got hit by a car at uh, Majeska Peak on the, uh, on the highway there, 27 years old. But that's how we lose golden eagles. Next, please. That is an angry female red tail. Now she's lightened up. This is a red-shouldered hawk uh, taken by my good photographer friend, Richard Jackson. This, is a, this, these, this pair is from Orange County. 
But again, this very common raptors, numbers of breeding pairs have dropped by about 70%. And uh, I, I, I can't, uh, I have no explanation for why they're dropped. All I can do is monitor the fact that they're doing a little bit better than they were say in 2005, 2010. Uh, fortunately or happily, there's three pairs of them uh, that we've discovered within the Prado Basin. That's a healthy number, but wouldn't surprise me if we could support a half a dozen, 10 pairs. Next, please. I mentioned the barn owl. This is a, a really great program. Um, very, uh, barn owls have suffered greatly as a result of habitat loss, as you might imagine. There's a lot of us people that moved into Southern California. Well, the Prado Basin is a place where barn owls can nest in, uh, in uh, produce lots of young, uh, lots of mice and rats running around in the grasses. And um, they're a very prolific species and they utilize nest boxes, which is a, a boon to people like me who are interested in banding barn owls because all I have to do is bring a ladder. No spikes needed, no, no cherry pickers, costly cherry pickers. Next, please. And long before I got there, there was a program to help out the Western screech owls. Uh, well, actually, there were, it was a program to help out wood, wood ducks, but uh, wood ducks and Western screech owls use the same sort of uh, holes or cavities and trees. And a lot of the waterfowl boxes were usurped uh, by these screech owls. And some of them have been recaptured up to, uh, up to the age of five. Next, please. Great horned owls, quite a lot larger. Uh, good place for great horned owls. We had, let me see here. Um, we, had, we had great horned owls nesting in three locations. I'm quite certain there were more than three pairs. You can see there's a wood rat behind that, that last, the second young. Um, our oldest great horned is 2021. 20, um, most of the raptors that breed in Prado Basin return to the Prado Basin. That is, their young return to that immediate vicinity of Prado Basin and Chino Hill State Park. Uh, when I say near, five to ten miles, meaning they're, they're relatively follow Patrick. Next, please. Cooper's hawks. Guarantee you there's more than the number we observe. We have five locations. I'm quite certain uh, it's probably in the neighborhood of eight or 10 pairs that are nesting in the Prado Basin. They really like willows, um, like all hawks, they build their own nests. And uh, this one happens to be a, a group of four, a bird hunting hawk. Um, seems that the Vero's are still doing well, despite all the Cooper's hawks. Uh, must keep their heads low. Next, please. And here's the white-tailed kite. Uh, the species that uh, has, has, has declined uh, most drastically, uh, speaking for not only Orange County, but Southwestern California. By example, uh, back in 1974, the San Joaquin Marsh, UCI Preserve, I had a roost there with 404 kites at the one roost. And I knew of a half a dozen other roosts that were smaller. Today, none of those roosts exist. So there were probably in the order of, uh, in 1974, knowing what those other roosts supported roughly, there were probably 500 kites that day at various roosts that I was aware of. Today, we can find less than 10 pairs in Orange County. And it isn't all habitat loss at all. There's too much great open space. And I'm pleased to say that the Prado Basin is some of the best of it. Next. This short-eared owl, real quick, I know I'm probably going over time here. Uh, this bird actually was found emaciated uh, about three miles away in San Bernardino County. And the rehabber knew me. And when she called, I was really quite excited to hear that she had a short-eared owl. I hadn't even seen one in, in 10 years. 
another one of those species that has dropped off drastically throughout California. In my opinion, this is the most endangered raptor in the state, even more than the California condor. That's how few there are, that's how few breeding pairs there are today. But happily, the rehab facility, local one in San Bernardino, I can't remember their name, unfortunately, right now, but um, it was uh, their good care that brought this short-eared owl back, back to life. I think it, all, it, all that happened was it, it uh, flew over a lot of Southern California. There was no habitat to hunt in, and it was basically starving to death when um, the, the bird was reported. We banded it and let it go at uh, the Prado Basin. So Prado Basin now has this migratory short-eared owl. It's probably on its way home um, in the next two weeks or a month. Next, please. Thank you all. Now I've forgotten who's coming next. Uh, that'll be me. I'm Cameron Macbeth. And Thank you, I'm Cameron. <laughs> field biologist with the uh, Orange County Water District for five years now, just over five years. And I'll be presenting to you guys today a uh, bird's eye view of Prado, the 2020 drone highlights. And first off, we'll go into a little bit of background on the drone program, not too much detail. So if there are more questions, I can try to answer those at the end. And then also two of our projects, which are the Prop 84 runner removal and also the sediment demonstration project. I've got a few pics and videos um, to show you guys of those. And then lastly, our most recent fire, the airport fire. Off to the right on the slide is our drone setup. It's a DJI Phantom 3. It's a couple years old at this point and uh, happy to say it's actually our original drone. It has not been uh, crashed or too severely as some of, uh, well, I'll just say our other departments of the district who have lost a couple of drones. Next slide. So brief background, what we're looking at here is actually a sectional chart that a traditional pilot will use. Uh, they're very busy, very crazy looking. Um, this is showing all the different types of airspace that we have in Southern California. I'll let uh, our viewers try to take a guess as to where they think Prado might be. Uh, a little hint off to the um, one side of the photo, uh, to the left, you'll see a red circle, that's Disneyland. So that's probably something that uh, I think we're all most common with. And then in a few moments, we'll see a green oval pop up and that'll show us where Prado is and you can see how close you are. So hopefully you could uh, maybe spot out where Corona and Chino Airport were. We are right in between those. Uh, Corona Airport is at the bottom of that uh, green oval. And then Chino Airport is just to the north and it's primarily the Chino airspace that uh, overlies us here at Prado. Next. Due to the complex airspace that we have here, I did need to receive an official certification through the FAA and that is their part 107 certification and is something I've had for a few years now, and I have to renew every two years. Some of the uses that we've had for our drone include uh, wildlife monitoring. This here is an example of um, a double crested cormorant rookery that we have down at Anaheim area, Anaheim Lake. Um, on the right side, you'll see a good close up photo of what these guys look like and where they get their name double crested. Uh, looks more like kind of a crazy eyebrows than an actual crest but um, they're pretty cool looking birds. They're fish eaters and they like to nest uh, in groups like this. Um, and we will use the drone uh, at our rookeries to get a more accurate count of uh, the number of nests that we have in those areas. But we also use it at a egret colony where it's primarily snowy egrets to help get these counts. We've also done these uh, surveys from the ground uh, using binoculars in the past, but using a drone can help us get uh, an even more accurate count of the number of nests. Some of our other uses that we have include uh, doing some aerial imagery. I've um, created what is called an orthomosaic, which is basically a fancy word for having the drone take a bunch of pictures and then having software post, uh, sorry, not post, but stitch those pictures together and create a uh, very current high resolution aerial map that we can work with. I have also used it um, with collaborating with some of our other departments, engineering, for example, to capture some pre and post project pictures or videos. And some of those that um, I'll be showing to you today will be the property board project. Other uses include uh, doing quick damage assessments when we've gotten a lot of rain. Um, we've 
had some floods impact us here at our wetlands where they've taken out some of our berms. And then it also includes, as you'll see, um, fires. We had uh, that most recent fire that I will show you guys a video of. So Prop 84, uh, first project I'm gonna be showing to you guys is a state funded uh, removal project. It's targeting uh, 650 acres of Arundo. Um, and you guys will see what Arundo looks like. And I'll talk a little bit more about that uh, in the video that's coming up after this. And so what you guys will be seeing uh, next is just a short video of uh, what the equipment that we use looks like. So this here is a, it's called a Barco and it's got this large shredding attachment at the front of it. It's basically Prado's version of a giant lawnmower and what it is mowing down is a rundo. Uh, just to give you guys some perspective, that machine is about 15 feet tall and the rundo is towering over it. Uh, so the rundo can grow anywhere from 25 to 30 feet tall. You can see that he's got quite a bit more work ahead of him to do, at least when this photo was taken. Um, and it's been a very useful tool out here uh, for us to remove a rundo, which is uh, directly helped, as Natalia mentioned, um, the recovery of the Vireo. So up next, we're gonna see a video, uh, sorry, not a video, but a picture of a before and after shot of one of these areas off to the left is a rundo uh, before it had been um, attacked with that barco and removed. And then the photo on the right is showing that same area. You'll need to see, it's a slightly different view, but if you find that curved road in the lower left of the photo on the left, you'll find that same curve and about midway up in the photo on the right. Um, that's that same road. Uh, the reason that you're only seeing some of the rundo removed is because the rundo on the left is actually on Army Corps of Engineer property. So the operator using his phone is actually able to see where the property boundaries are uh, in real time while he's running the equipment. So he can be very precise uh, while he's doing his work out in the field. And you'll notice um, a couple of things that are of interest uh, in this photo is that some of that Arundel is already growing back. There's a few green patches there in that largely brown area where the Arundel, even though it had been mowed maybe a week or two before is already re-sprouting. So what'll happen after the initial removal is uh, Sawa, who was mentioned earlier, they have an invasive species uh, spray crew who will come in. They've been contracted to treat any regrowth with um, herbicides. Uh, why we also like this tool, as you can see in the photo on the right, is that they can be very strategic in removing just the Arundo and leaving the natives. So you have a good cluster of native willows and other natives um, left at the site. Unfortunately, it is very clear because uh, the Arundo did it can take over these areas very quickly and um, can cover a lot of ground. So that's why we like to attack it. Next, I will believe we'll be showing uh, our sediment demonstration project. So this is a joint project between the Water District and the Army Corps of Engineers. The initial goal was to relocate 120,000 cubic yards of sediment that has accumulated behind the dam over time. And I've got some photos to show you guys real quick of what the project set looked like before. They broke ground. Um, in the next photo, you'll see what it looks like when they were about midway through clearing all of that veg. It's been gathered together in piles. And the last photo you guys will see is that same site um, ready for them to finally bring in some of the pumping equipment. Next up, you, you'll get to see a video of what that project looks like in action. So for this project, they use a combination of uh, heavy equipment to basically excavate out all that dirt, which was then placed into that red piece of equipment there. It was a large sifting machine that would sift out any debris and leave just sand. And then that sand would be poured into that yellow funnel mixed with some of the St. Anna River water and pumped out to the storage location site, which was about a half mile south uh, towards the 91 freeway on Army Corps of Engineering uh, property down there. Excavators pretty much worked uh, all day, every day that these guys were out here working on site. Uh, it was a pretty impressive operation uh, seeing them move this amount of dirt in a relatively quick time period. So it did uh, largely prove that this could be a successful method for removing sediment from the basin. And lastly, I'll be showing you guys um, 
some aerial footage that I captured with our drone following the airport fire that happened just in the beginning of December last year. Um, they're not totally certain what caused it, but we're pretty confident that it was started in a homeless encampment and it did burn a total of just over a thousand acres, which is very similar to the number of acres uh, to a fire we had back in 2015, the highway fire, which also had a similar footprint. And unfortunately, the fire did halt the sediment project. Uh, that large pipe that was in that video of the project uh, is made of a thick plastic. And unfortunately, uh, it was in the path of the fire and it uh, some of it was melted in some sections. And at that point, they had already removed, I believe, uh, about 88,000 cubic yards of sediment. And it was going to be too costly to get that going again. But they were able to show it worked. So next up, we'll see that video. There's the project off to the left. They're still packing up their equipment. They were done at this point. Fortunately for this fire, actually, let me jump back. So off to, to the upper areas, you'll see some fire retardant, Cal Fire. I was able to come in and spray some fire retardant on the northern boundary of the fire. And they were successful being able to halt the fire from moving into our wetlands. Uh, which we are very uh, thankful for. A lot of this area that we're seeing um, open expanse was actually the Arundel removal area, so not as bad um, of a fire as it might have looked like. And this area here, though, is actually what's left of the uh, Army Corps property where there is no Arundel removal. You'll note that there's a lot more ash, um, hence why it's the reason why it's a lot more black in this area than some of the others, is there's a lot more material that burned. So hopefully if they're wise enough, they could come in and spray this area before it starts to regrow and they don't have to bring in any equipment. Some of what we're seeing here are our access roads that we have that go throughout the basin that our operators maintain. And a lot of these trees that we're seeing are actually our native willows that look to be, uh, some of them still actually do have some greenery on them and some foliage. So we're pretty hopeful that this fire was not too destructive um, and basically making a moonscape of our lands out here. Uh, but these trees we'll see pretty soon as spring is fast approaching, should start to uh, leaf out soon and we'll be able to see uh, the survivorship of some of these trees. Right now the drone is heading west towards Chino Hills. Uh, there's some more of our roads that we used to access the basin as well as a fire break the Cal Fire crews put in using their dozers. This large clearing right here was the staging area for Cal Fire where they had their engines and other equipment, uh, including dozers, uh, when they battled this fire. Some of our own operators came through and then later rehabbed that area um, just to smooth it out and hopefully we'll get to see that recover as well. And in this area, it looks like a lot of our natives survived. So again, we're pretty hopeful that uh, this area is actually going to come back looking pretty well. And with that, I will turn it over to uh, my colleague. Thank you, Cameron. Uh, my name is David McMichael. I am also a wildlife biologist with the Orange County Water District. I've been with the Water District for almost 14 years now. And what I'm going to do is give you a, an update on our bird, bird box program in Orange County, as well as a little bit in Prado Basin, and also a little bit of a background on the program in general. So this program began back in 2012. That's when we started putting up large numbers of boxes. And th the original idea for this program was to, was, was a biological approach in controlling nuisance insects. So insects such as midges, mayflies, and even um, mosquitoes as well. Um, all those, those are all very common along the river and also our uh, waterways. You'll see in that picture there, that's actually a tree swallow coming out of one of our PVC boxes. We have boxes that are made of wood and PVC. 
Uh, next slide. So this is a, a map of our, our, our boxes in the Orange County area. So we have 431 boxes. And we had 431 boxes in 2020 at 18 different locations along the Santa Ana River. And that encompasses three different cities. So there's Yorba Linda, Anaheim, and the city of Orange. And you see all those little, those colored dots there. Those are all different, different groupings of boxes in uh, different facilities and along the river itself. So, so basically starting up close to the Imperial Highway area, working down river through the Santa Ana River, kind of concluding around the Ball Road Basin. So near, near the Honda Center, if you're familiar with that, that's kind of where, where we, what's well, our property line. <laughs> so if you look over to the bottom right corner, you'll see there's 15 boxes in Santiago Basin. So that's, that's uh, Santiago Creek. So we do we have a few boxes down there. And really, I mean, really the only condition for us to place a box is the presence of water. So the birds that we're trying to attract to the boxes re require water nearby. Um, so again, you know, you're, we're not gonna have boxes in, in some of the drier locations. Uh, next slide. This is a box, a map of the boxes at Prado Basin. So Prado Basin, uh, there's fewer boxes. Uh, we have had 172 last year, seven locations. Um, the box program out of Prado is kind of a collaboration of other water districts, um, some of the some of the different counties, uh, regional parks, et cetera. And we, although we do we do have uh, quite a few boxes within the wetlands, you see at the bottom of the map there we have 72 boxes actually in the Prado wetlands. But if you go up Chino Creek, you see there's 13 boxes along the creek there. You go all the way up to uh, the 20, the green, the green uh, little figure there. That's uh, Prado Regional Park, and then all the way up to in up Chino Creek to where we have 24 boxes. That's the Chino Park Wetlands on the grounds of the uh, Inland Empire Utility Agency. So again, you know, we're, we're, we we assist to some of these other agencies with their box program, and, and really what that means is we help them find volunteers to monitor the boxes. And then later we'll, we'll crunch the data for them and, and uh, report the data. So uh, next slide. So we, we have um, a lot of people helping us with, with this program. Uh, we, we have relationships with some local carpenters that'll help make boxes for us. Uh, the Boy Scouts of America. Um, we've even had some Girl Scouts make boxes. And you'll see on that photo to the right there, that's some Boy Scouts helping us put boxes up in one of our basins. That's Burris Basin, uh, which um, is in Anaheim, just, just uh, up upstream of Honda Honda Center. Now we all, we'll put boxes on fence lines, we'll, we'll hang them up in trees. Sometimes they'll be on, on just mounted on poles close, close to the water's edge in some of the basins, our recharge basins. Uh, next slide. So here's some of these nuisance insects. On the left there, those are midges, and on the right is the mayfly. Um, we get both of these insects in huge numbers, huge meaning just billions. Uh, midges are very common early in the season. They're, they're, they're pretty abundant even right now. We have, we have quite a few midges around. Uh, mayflies, as the name applies, they do, they do come a little bit later. Um, not so much in, they, they, you know, May May is a typical month on the East Coast, but we'll get them a little bit earlier here. You know, even maybe as early as March, we'll start seeing mayflies, and they have that distinctive tail. So both both of those insects are um, real abundant on the river. Next slide. You see here, that's one of our facilities along the river, and those are all mayflies, and those are. Uh, those are spider webs on that building. So um, it's, it's quite, a, quite a bit for one spider to eat probably, but um, they do help us with the, uh, 
with the nuisance insects as well. Uh, next slide. So tree swallows. So this is the species that we're, we're typically trying to attract to the boxes. And historically, there, there's been tree swallows in Orange County for, for many years, going back 50, 100 years probably. But in more recent years, they've been, they've been harder, to, harder to find. And that, the, the reason being um, is just lack of tree cavity. So these guys are cavity nesters. So they nest in the holes, usually woodpecker, uh, woodpecker holes and, and trees. And we just don't have a lot of that left in Orange County. So, so they disappear for a number of years. And then, you know, in the early 80s, 90s, people start putting boxes up and they start making a comeback along the river. So when we started this program in 2012, there were, there were very few pairs nesting along the river. Um, and you, you'll see a, a further, further slide down the road here, um, how many we have now. So we, 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 tree swallows are great because they're easy to attract. They're very instinctive when they when they see a hole. I mean, they're, they're, they'll you'll see them trying to nest in light fixtures, uh, telephone poles, anything that that looks like they could nest in it. They'll be checking it out. So they're very easy to attract. Next slide. So again, why tree swallows? And besides being easy to attract, uh, they eat a heck of a lot of insects. So. Uh, you can read the caption there, but you know, basically, a, a, a swallow adult will eat about 60 insects every hour from dawn to dusk. So one so one swallow will eat 700 to 850 insects each day, and a number we we you typically see is about 300,000 insects eaten per family per season. So that's one family. Or that's basically one box. So some sometimes these guys will have one, you know, two families in a season. So about 300 insects, 300,000 insects. Now, that that sounds like a huge number. Actually, I, I believe that that number is actually higher in our facilities because every year they show up a bit earlier. You know, we have them showing up in January now, and they 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 stick around for about six months in Orange County now. And that's every year it seems like it's a little bit longer. And that's that's due to climate change and other factors. Uh, it could also be due to um, wet years, for instance, so there are more insects around. So these guys are these guys are eating a lot of insects. Uh, next slide. Uh, just a few other species that we have along the river of swallows. Uh, barn swallows, uh, cliff swallows. Now, cliff swallows are these are the same swallows that show up, or they're supposed to show up at uh, San Juan Capistrano every year. They don't always do, but uh, we have thousands of these guys nesting up and down the river, on the freeway overpasses, bridges, um, and again, cliff swallows. Cliff swallows eat again hundreds of thousands of insects each year, so they're also uh, contributing. Uh, next slide. So this is the, the data page. So you see at the, the top left, 2012, that's when we started. That year we put up 266 boxes. And, and that year it, it was just me doing this. So I, we didn't really track them very closely, but we know for sure that 63 of the boxes were used. That's just one year. So that's 63 pairs that probably weren't nesting otherwise along the Santa Ana River. So if you go down to 2020, which is this last year, you'll see we had 431 boxes, 353 of the boxes were used. So that, that was the highest box usage in the nine years that we, we've um, had this program. So 346 successful broods. So 346 nests were successful. That was an 83% 83 success rate, which is pretty high for these guys. We had 66 uh, pairs go a second time, uh, which is pretty, um, pretty, pretty great, actually, considering most places in the country, 
tree swallows typically nest once, one time. Um, our, our birds tend to go a second time, or a lot of them do. So that's a bit unusual. And we, and we produced 1,020 fledglings. So that's 1,020 birds, chicks made it out of the box. So that's a good thing. If you look in 2019, um, numbers are very similar. We actually had more fledglings in 2019. So these, these two years, 2019 to 2020 were wet years. 2019 in particular was a very wet year. So a lot of, when you, when you have wet years, you have a lot of insects. That means the whole river, Bankton Bank is full of water. All of our facilities are full of water. Uh, that breeds a lot of insects. So these guys were eating really well the last couple of years. And, and the, the numbers show it. If you go up to 2013, 2014, those are dry years. And you'll see that uh, there, were, there, were, there were not as many uh, second attempts those years. Um, the fledgling count was, was pretty low those years. Um, so, so wet years really do matter. matter. Um, if you look over on the right, we, we do get quite a few bluebirds. Um, our facilities are, are not perfect habitat for bluebirds, so we don't get a lot, but we, uh, we do get them. We do get some usage out of them. And you'll, you'll see this year, well, 2020, we had 35 bluebird, bluebird nests. Um, so still quite a few. A lot of those are on the public bike trail. And you'll, you'll think that those, the fledgling totals are a little low. And that's because we don't, we don't heavily monitor the bike trail birds. We know, we know they're being used. We know they're successful. And we will check a box if, if there's any issues. Um, but we're not exactly sure how many nestlings come out of those boxes. That's why that number is a little bit low. If you go down to the bottom line, you'll see Prado. And those are the Prado numbers for last year. So 172 boxes, 131 used. So they get high usage out of Prado. Um, Prado is a great place, lots of water every year, lots of insects. Um, 124 successful broods, four, over 400 fledglings. So. Uh, Prado was Prado was good last year. Uh, no, no bluebirds at Prado though. No. And I think uh, next slide. So yep, yeah, that's a good picture of a bluebird pair there. One of our facilities. Uh, happy pair of bluebirds. So thank you. Great, and thank you so much to our amazing natural resources staff members and our guest speaker, Dr. Peter Bloom, for your presentation today. Uh, we're now going to, and I know we're close to the end of the hour, but um, we do have a few questions that have come in. And if our participants are, are willing to stay on for a few minutes longer, our speakers have generously um, offered to stay um, for a few minutes as well uh, to answer questions. Um, so again, as a reminder, you can answer, you can ask questions in the Q&A box um, or go ahead and use the raise hand feature. And I do see some raised hands up and and some questions that have been submitted. But um, you know, let's start with the question that we've received um, during the registration process. And that question is, you know, who can volunteer to help wildlife thrive? And where do I sign up? So I, <clears throat> we have not gone the route of, um, using, we, we don't have any kind of a docent program or um, uh, the, the time or the staff to manage a docent program. People don't realize, but, but training folks to involve them in programs like this uh, takes so much time that you really got to dedicate staff to it. And, um, but I would say that there are a number of other organizations, great organizations out there that do accept uh, volunteers and, and volunteer help. Um, the best we can do is we have occasionally, we've opened up Prado, for example, to um, staff, family, and interested parties for people to come out and, um, and help with a planting program. Uh, habitat restoration or something like that. 
I don't know if anybody else has some input on that as well. The only thing I would chime in with is maybe just check out your local Audubon chapter. Um, some of those chapters do have um, some pretty cool opportunities for people to be at least somewhat involved with wildlife. Um, just my thoughts. Also, yeah, David, uh, I'd like to mention that we, you know, we have, as I mentioned, we have a number of places where we put bird boxes that are public places, recreational trails, parks, and so forth. And, you know, we're always willing to accept people just, you know, the, the contribute observations that they report, you know, from those, those places, places like the bike trail. Uh, we just don't have a lot of boots on the ground at those places. So if somebody walks the bike trail every day, you know, and they could, we could provide them with a map and they could report on observations and whatnot. Places like that would, 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 be, would be helpful because we just don't get there often ourselves. I will answer similarly that um, we utilize, we meaning Bloom Biological or my nonprofit Bloom Research Inc. Um, annually um, uh, to good effect on the Irvine Ranch Conservancy and locations such as those or the Prado Basin, uh, looking for raptor nests or if the, you know, depending upon most of the people who volunteer with us are biologists or wannabe biologists who are young people looking for experience in going for a degree. Having said that, some of the best volunteers that uh, I've ever had working with me are uh, retired people. Um, we used to, Dick and I together at, at various times have uh, conducted mist netting out of the Coachella Valley Reserve and on Rancho Mission Viejo within Gobernadora Canyon. And, and um, some of our very best people who helped on those trips to facilitate our classes were older adults who simply really got involved. So I guess what I would say is um, leave, leave me or leave us your, your email address somehow or another and we'll get back to you and, and see what it is you might be able to contribute. Um, it, it kind of depends on your expertise, your age. Now, I know speaking for myself, I love tree climbers, <laughs> particularly guys who climb 70 foot eucalyptus, if any of those are out there. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Uh, you know, next question, um, are you able to balance the um, herbicide use for Arundo removal in a manner to minimize negative impacts to raptors and other bird species? Yes. Great. I, I would like to say that the removal of Arundo facilitates the expansion of many nesting birds of prey, such as white-tailed kites, red-shouldered hawks, red-tailed hawks, and, and others, uh, Cooper's hawks. Arundo almost provides zero habitat of any quality for either nesting birds of prey or foraging habitat. Great point. Anything happening with steelhead and or estuaries within district responsibility? Steelhead or what? Steelhead? Is there anything happening with steelhead or estuaries? S Sam and Dick, you're hearing her? Oh, I, yeah. <laughs> no, I, I heard that part. I didn't get the <laughs> estuary part <laughs> at the beginning. Yeah, the, um, the issue with steelhead on the Santa Ana River is that the river has been so narrowly confined um, for flood control purposes and hardened and whatnot that um, any reasonable efforts to restore um, um, a salmonid run on the river, um, I just, I'm not sure how you'd even go about it. It's kind of like there are so many other low-hanging, uh, uh, so other so many other creeks that come comprise low-hanging fruit compared to what the what you have to do on the Santa Ana. Um, that I don't know that anybody has gone there. 
uh, the estuary is on the county uh, is on uh, county and city property. Um, and, um, you know, and, and is, is very subject to um, sedimenting in and, and whatnot. I mean, it would take, I don't know what it would take. It would be a, a pretty Herculean task to, to go there for migratory fish and adramus fish. Oh, great, thank you for that, Dick. And I do have uh, one hand up. I'm going to uh, call on this attendee here um, and hope they could ask their question. Uh, Anastasia? Just unmute yourself. Anastasia, can you ask your question? You might be unmuted again. Hi, so no, I'm sorry because yeah, I'm with the kids. No, I'm good, thank you. Okay, no problem. <laughs> uh, maybe just one question if I'm interested in volunteering job, but I have a, a kid, so could I uh, to be volunteering with the kids or maybe, I don't know, some family, friends, uh, volunteering opportunity for myself, so. I think that the question was, you know, are there any, similar to our first question too, are there any possible volunteering opportunities or anything for, um, you know, for students? Yeah, for family, that can yeah, get for involved? Students, for family, yeah. Yeah, thank you for helping me. <laughs> uh, again, um, the, the, because of the district's charge um, and um, what we, what we engage in and whatnot is so highly technical and involves so many different land ownerships and listed species and everything. The amount of training that needs to be involved with um, getting volunteers uh, out into district wildlands to actually help. Uh, we've just never, never gone there. It's complicated. Um, we have considered in the past, we've, we've had open houses at Prado for um, uh, staff and, and uh, families and uh, associated people and agencies and whatnot. And we've considered um, doing those when things uh, loosen up uh, with the COVID pandemic. Um, you know, we might consider um, holding <laughs> events uh, again uh, periodic, but to get a regular volunteer program going, um, the the ones to check with besides the Audubon Society, there's the Native Plant Society, there's um, various friends groups. Every piece of open space in the, in each county has an associated uh, friends group and or nonprofit um, that help. Um, care for the land there and whatnot. And I think, um, you know, there's, there's a lot of opportunities there. If, if we get to the point where we can offer that on district land, um, at least, uh, uh, you know, an event, um, we'll, we'll make that uh, announcement on the website and, and let folks know. Thank you, Dick. And, and I'll also add yeah. that um, OCWD, of course, that, you know, OCWD does offer a variety of, of educational programs. Uh, currently, uh, they are virtual programs, but um, covering a, a wide range of topics. And of course, this, this water webinar is part of that uh, educational program as well. But uh, there's something for all ages. So uh, definitely continue to check out the OCWD website uh, for more information and uh, you know, new programs that, uh, that we launch. Uh, so great. So you know, with that, uh, thank you so much for, for everyone that, that stayed behind a, a, an extra few minutes with us and to all our speakers today and um, all the attendees that joined us to hear this great presentation. Uh, very much appreciate all your time today. And uh, again, this presentation recording uh, will be available um, and sent to the registered attendees so, and available on our website. 
thank you very much, everyone, and have a great day. Great job, you guys. Thank you. Hey.